Okay, we're now ready for our first set of decomposition problems. And of course it comes from the space of geometric vectors, because that's our starting point for everything. And after a few examples with geometric vectors, we'll move on to polynomials as usual, and then of course to Rn. And we'll spend the most time with Rn for reasons that will become clear at that time. Now all along we should be noting that despite the fact that these objects are as different as can be. The concept of decomposition applies equally well to all of them, and actually works in similar ways. Just like the concept of linear combinations applies to all of these different kinds of objects. All right, let's now turn our attention to our first set of examples. And our task will be to decompose the white vectors C, D, E, and F in terms of A and B. In these examples, are relatively easy. What makes them easy? It is of course this 90 degree angle between A and B. And I don't know what it is about 90 degree angles that makes for easy decomposition. Maybe it's the fact that we are used to thinking of things relative to the horizontal and vertical directions. Maybe it's the fact that we've been working with Cartesian coordinate systems for so long we're just very much used to them. I don't know what it is, but it is undeniable that having a 90 degree angle here makes decomposition by sight rather simple. So let's turn to our first task. I will actually step over here and step partially out of the shot. And let's decompose the vector C in terms of the vectors A and B. And I would submit that it is easy to see that we need half of A and one of B half of A plus one of B equals C. So let me write these numbers in and then say a couple more things about it. Half of A and one of B. So how did I do it? So I actually think I did it by trial and error. And as always, it helps to be really good at the forward problem to understand the inverse problem. So you really have to master addition before you try to learn subtraction. And you have to be really good at multiplication before you can do division. So here, you have to be pretty good at linear combinations in order to do the opposite, the inverse, decomposition. And I think what my brain did, I'm not sure what your brain did, but I think what my brain did was try a few different options. Maybe the first thing I tried was A plus B and I realized I'm over here. Well, I'm too far over in this way. So then I tried one half A and that worked. So it's this subconscious, intuitive trial and error. I really think that's all it is. So in all of these problems, uh, yes, some thinking may be involved, but it's really ultimately trial and error with a little bit of experience and then later on with a lot more experience. Okay, so we're done with C. With C. We have solved our very first decomposition problem. And right here I would like to go on a little tangent and remind you of a different problem that at least algebraically looks exactly the same. But unlike this problem, which had a well-defined solution, that problem didn't have a good solution. I'm talking of course about the problem of dollar bills and quarters. Let me remind you what it was. I pulled out my drawer and I discovered that I have some dollar bills and some quarters I counted them all up and I realized I had a hundred dollars. And the question I posed to you was, well, how many dollar bills and how many quarters did I find? And of course it was impossible to tell. But if you had written down the problem algebraically, it would actually look exactly the same. Here's what it would look like. You have, I have found a hundred dollars and it's comprised of some amount of dollar bills Okay, and some amount of quarters. Okay, so do you see how it looks exactly the same? We have a known result and we have to identify two coefficients. And of course, unlike this problem, this problem didn't have a good solution because I could have a hundred dollars and no quarters or I could have ninety dollar bills and forty quarters or I could have $10 bills and whatever number of quarters would make it right. So there isn't a unique solution. So what makes this 
that actually looks exactly the same as this, different from it? Well, it's a question that's actually a little bit hard to answer precisely at this point. Later on, we'll give a very precise answer to this question. At this point, all I can say is that the set of vectors is much richer than the set of numbers. After all, yes, I gave them fancy drawings, but all it is is just numbers. This is one and this is one quarter. So what we're learning is that the richer the objects, the more likely it is that decomposition will be possible. It will be the same uh, situation with polynomials. Of course, polynomials are richer than numbers. And Rn, n numbers, is richer than one number. So the richer the object, the more feasible decomposition. The ultimate example is, of course, audio signals. Audio signals are combined and our ear receives a single, a single signal, yet with apparently no effort whatsoever, your brain decomposes it into the individual voices and notes and sounds and so forth. Why is that possible? Well, the answer we're beginning to see right now is that audio signals are just extremely rich. They carry with them a lot of information and your brain uses that information for decomposition. So the richer the objects, the more likely decomposition. And that's the fundamental difference, which we'll later exactly quantify between this example and this example. Okay, now we're ready to move on to the second example, which is D. So I encourage you to pause the video and try to answer this question on your own, and then come back and check with us. But remember, if you're struggling to do it, it's simply for lack of experience, which you're currently acquiring. All it is, really, is trial and error and being very good at linear combinations. So here is how I see it. If I were to flip the vector A, and it would then coincide with E, well then it just would be a straight sum by the parallelogram rule. So what we need to do is take minus A and B. And that's how we get D. So minus A, which if we want to make the coefficient explicit, we write minus 1. Otherwise, we could just write minus A plus 1B. And of course, this is also a matter of making the coefficient explicit. Right? If I were writing this a little bit more casually, I would just write minus A plus B or B minus A. And this one I would simply write as half A plus B. Okay, and just like that, we're done with two decomposition examples. Let's move on to the third one, E. Once again, perhaps you want to pause the video and answer this question on your own. It's one of those questions that may actually be so simple, it's confusing. It's clearly, not clearly, definitely the simplest of the four we have on the board. And that's what might cause you a little bit of hesitation. But here's the answer. E is opposite of A. So it's just minus A. So we don't need the vector B to get the vector E. All we need is A. So we need 0 of B and minus 1 of A. And once again, if I were writing this casually, I would simply write E equals minus A. There you go. We're done with three examples. And on to the last one, F. Now, F is easily seen to be opposite of C. That's how I would work F. Had we not done C first, this would actually will we'll take a moment because there is quite a bit of trial and error to exercise. But now that we have C and we know what it is, we simply recognize that F is opposite of C. And if C is one half plus B, one half A plus B, then F must be minus one half minus B, which we'll write as minus one. Okay, and here we go. We're done with our first four linear decomposition examples. In the next video, we'll consider more complicated examples. And what will make them more complicated? We will no longer have the right angle between these two vectors. One thing I forgot to mention, which is when we're talking about 90 degree angles, and horizontal and vertical directions, and I acknowledge that having a 90 degree angle makes for easy decomposition by sight. I should have mentioned that there is still nothing at all special about the horizontal direction. 
Now I drew the vector A horizontally and the vector B vertically, but I didn't have to do it. I could have rotated the whole thing by whatever angle and it would not have made these problems any more complicated. The 90 degree angle is very helpful, but this perfect orientation with the horizontal and vertical alignment does not help at all. Maybe a tiny bit. Had the entire system been rotated by some angle, we would still be able to do all of this rather easily. Maybe it would have helped to turn our heads a little bit, and I think a lot of us would have done it just to orient yourself to the picture. But ultimately, that's not what counts. It's the 90 degree angle. And in the next video, we will no longer have a 90 degree angle, so the problems will, uh, truth honestly, be a little bit more complicated. Now, I would like to leave you with just one very important question. And that question is, are these answers unique? In other words, for any one of these vectors, could we have come up with different numbers that would have gone into these linear combinations that would have still produced these vectors? It's a very important question, and you must definitely spend a little bit of time thinking about it. And meanwhile, I'll prepare the picture for the next video.